Hello, everyone. I see a couple of you are still connecting to audio. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, and so thank you for joining our webinar today. We're going to be talking about a, a market update and uh, some of the things that you need to be thinking about for your small business as it um, pertains to the trends that we're seeing in the economy right now. So um, we are recording this and we'll send it out um, afterwards. Uh, so you'll have access to the materials. You can always access our recordings in the video library on our website. Um, and we want this to be as interactive as possible. We have a pretty small group today, which sometimes is a benefit because we can all share a little bit more than if we had a larger group. Um, so we will be asking you to come off mute and share if you're um, willing and able to do that this morning um, so we can all learn from each other. But we are so happy to have Adrian Hovey with us today. He's a financial advisor with Edward Jones and um, longtime friend of the SBDC. So thank you, Adrian, for being with us. And we're excited to hear what you have to tell us. Excellent. Uh, you're too kind, Hannah, too kind. Um, but I am happy to be here. This topic is clearly pretty timely. Um, as Hannah mentioned, you know, I'm a financial advisor, also a small business owner. Um, I've been studying it and helping small businesses for, you know, going on a decade plus now. So um, that being said, I don't, you know, necessarily know everything about everybody's situation. Um, and, you know, please understand that, that, you know, my, my voice is just one amongst the many, but what would be awesome is since we do have that small group, can you guys either pop it in the chat or come off mute or something and just tell me what kind of business you're in and, and what role you have so I can maybe tailor my comments and, and my presentation today a little bit more specifically for you guys. I'll just sit here awkwardly while you all do that. <laughs> Hopefully we're we're gonna have a bunch of different people. So, okay, we got a private council practice. Cool. Okay. All right. Excellent. Um, just pulling up the chat here. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. Good stuff. Okay. Um, okay. Got it. All right. So we got some interesting stuff out there. It looks like. Um, we've got a few people in some spread out industries, which is kind of neat. So um, I think then we'll, we'll maybe just get started with the, the broader economic context, go through some, some interesting stuff that's happening in the market and a few different ways we can visualize it. And then um, I have a few scenarios or a few just kind of points I'd like to mention, I think that are, that are relevant across all of these industries that you guys are in. And then I'm going to turn it over to you guys to tell me what's important to you. And we'll talk about that. So let us then let's go to a couple of things. Like obviously um, this has not been a great year in the market for, I think um, really any sort of investment that people have, right? It's been tough on the bond market. It's been tough on the stock market. It's been tough on crypto. So that's the landscape we're living in. What you're looking at here is just showing kind of, where the badness has been. And, and this kind of goes through the first couple of quarters of the year. Um, the, the dark blue on the left side, that's sort of the bond market. And the darker green is the equities market. And you can see pretty much without really any exception, um, the, the stock market and the bond market have been performing pretty poorly this year. So, you know, we, Many reasons for that. Um, the supply chain crisis has been blamed on a, a, a lot of things. Um, you know, whatever, regardless of whatever industry you're in, I think that the key thing to remember is economies are cyclical, right? There, there are bear markets, there are bull markets, there's boom and bust. And oftentimes a cycle like this is very common. And so we've had a few interesting things happen this year. It is not terribly common that both the bond market and the stock market go down at the same time. A lot of that has to do with the, the interest rates and inflation. So um, does anybody, before I move off of this one, this shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, but does anybody have any specific questions on um, what, what, what you're looking at here, what the implication is? Okay, it, it's important, I think, that we look at this for just a second because there really isn't anywhere to go uh, as an investor that is any more or less um, 
like high or low performing than, than what you're looking at here, right? The gold market's been kind of all over the place. Um, the, the, the traditional way of, you know, retreating into bonds if the stock market is down, none of that has really been, you know, especially effective this year. And so, as we always say at my company, this stay, you know, keep your focus on high quality investments, right? Like the best companies you can, the, the ones that pay the dividends the longest, the highest quality credit, all of those things, because as investors, you know, that, that is the best chance we can evaluate something in terms of how it's going to recover. So the lesson here, everything can go down at the same time. That's a, a life lesson we all just learned. And the way that you manage it is to stay true to your own strategy, but making sure you're in the highest quality investments possible. So Adrian, I have a quick question. Um, I mean, obviously we see here that it hasn't been great for stocks and bonds. You mentioned also crypto. How does that fit in with small businesses? How can small businesses take advantage of that? And is it something they should be taking advantage of? Well, you, good question. Crypto is super hot topic at the beginning of the year. There was this concept or this idea that the the crypto market would be decoupled from the stock market, right? Like, oh, you know, regardless of what's happening over here with, with stocks and traditional, you know, investments, crypto has its own world where its own potential for growth is something different. And frankly, if, if you look at the way that crypto markets have performed in the last several months, it's almost lockstep with the stock market. And so there is not um, really any sane way to evaluate how the crypto market is going. It's, you know, from our company's standpoint, then most investors see it as purely speculative. Um, you know, so, so for example, there are a bunch of um, company or a bunch of countries in South America who are, you know, investing heavily in crypto and things to try to, you know, escape the crippling debts that their, their governments have and things like that. And, and cannot stress enough that these are all speculative types of things. There's no, um, you know, there's no backing to this in a traditional way that a, that a small business could look on and say, oh, this is a, this is a safe place to park some money. On the flip side, um, you know, potentially people are using it as a payment method. Um, when, when, when you see, you know, companies like Tesla, you know, introducing this as a, as a possibility for payment for a, a new car, there's an opportunity there for small businesses. And I don't know that the, the businesses we've got on the call today, maybe, maybe the solar area is, is it's possible to capture some of that. Um, you know, but, it, but offering it as a, a possible payment method, I think people are looking to liquidate it, looking to transition it from, from, you know, their crypto, crypto holdings to something else. So that might be an opportunity, uh, but you know, I'd, I'd be looking to divest out of it as quickly as possible into something that's a little bit more um, stable or you know, a little bit more evaluatable as, a, as an asset. Good to know, thank you. Are you guys seeing, I mean, have you I've been getting a lot of questions about crypto? We do get some questions, um, basically what I asked you of how can, should I take advantage of it and how would I even take advantage of it as a small business? Um, so I think that's really good advice, you know, that it's not as stable as some of your other options and maybe not something you want to um, take a chance with is what it sounds like. Yeah, we, we can, let's talk about it a little bit more then. Um, th those are those are good questions. And, and anytime somebody says take advantage of, Boy, there, there's so many, so much wrapped up in take advantage of, right? So one, one way that people have taken advantage of it is, is they've taken a loss, right? They've taken a massive loss on a, on a particular crypto holding that they can then later offset against gains elsewhere. So that's an opportunity, right? You can say, I bought crypto when it was, I bought a Bitcoin when it was $60,000, you know, per, now it's 21,000. So I've got a, you know, 39 almost $40,000 loss that I can write off on my taxes and I can use that to apply against capital gains down the road. That's a fun way to do it. Um, you know, it gets you out of a very, very risky asset class, you know, gives you an opportunity to harvest some losses. So, so that's something that's come up, but you know, anybody who, who comes across my desk, I tell them that as long as they're comfortable with that holding going to zero, go for it. Mm, yeah. So, Always good to keep in mind. Yeah. Okay, so this is something maybe a little bit more directly relevant to the folks on the call here. Um, you've all heard all this, this bantering back and forth between the talking heads about are we in a recession or are we not in a recession? And depending on who you ask and what definitions you use, you can kind of 
you know, support, I think, either claim. But this is an interesting one that we are looking at as a, as a suggestive of us not technically being in a recession. And if you just, to get right to the point, the gray bars on this represent recessions and the purple shows you rise in unemployment. So you look back in history, every single recession has been preceded by a rise in unemployment. And we're not really in that right now. We do not see rising unemployment, haven't seen it essentially since COVID. And so that's one of these pro arguments that say, hey, you know, the economy maybe isn't in as bad shape as you might hear about because we don't see this, you know, very obvious trend of rising unemployment. Not saying it couldn't come. You know, I, I think peeling back the onion. So whoever's in solar, um, you know, that that's sort of in the, the technical industry, but I think the earliest I heard of it was back in November of last year, you know, companies very quietly in the tech sector kind of putting the brakes on hiring. You know, Microsoft was one of them, um, Google. Uh, now they all kind of have an official hiring freeze and there's even some layoffs in some of those companies. But, you know, that's going to catch up, eventually affect the labor market. Uh, but that is something we're seeing, you know, virtually all of the major tech companies have kind of said, we're not hiring you know, we're, we're not adding headcount right now, and we're potentially looking to reduce that. And that's, you know, that's the tech industry, which has really been hammered pretty hard. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, what you guys are seeing out there. Are you seeing people coming back to work, not coming back to work? Are you hearing about layoffs? Kind of quick poll of the audience here. What, what are you guys seeing on the ground out there? Yeah, so it sounds like some people are, are looking for um, job searching. And, and so, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, not a, it's not a real, you know, fun time to think about looking for a new job. Are those folks in roles right now, um, Joanna, or are, they, or are they looking, you know, looking for a new role or they're unemployed and looking for a role? What have you seen? Yeah, finding a new job, sure. Yeah, yep, yep. It's, you know, it, it is it was kind of fast and loose for a while. And, and oftentimes you see this pendulum effect, right? Like who's got control in the labor market and, and you know, workers had control in the labor market pretty much all through the pandemic. Um, now that pendulum is starting to swing back the other way. So employers are gonna have a little bit more of the upper hand there. Um, there's tons of implications to that, uh, good and bad. So, you know, I, I would say, you know, as, as a, as somebody who is currently looking to fill a role in my own small business, um, it was very challenging earlier this year. And I hope that maybe there is a little bit of downward pressure there that, that kind of frees up some of these folks to go looking for new jobs. But, you know, in certain sectors like technology, I think it's going to be a little bit of a, of a, a darker outlook in, in terms of, you know, moving jobs or changing roles. So that's definitely something that you can all kind of keep in mind as a, as a point of, um, you know, strategy or discussion over the next couple of years, because I think there will be some folks in the, entering the job market. And I think unemployment's, you know, potentially going to be affected by that. Okay. So we all know, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on, on slower growth ahead. Um, but, but long story short is we know that growth is slowing. We know a lot of companies have already reduced their earnings um, forecasts for the remainder of the year. That shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. Um, we're still kind of, you know, the Fed got caught with their pants down a little bit with the inflation thing. It turned out to not be transitory. It's actually, you know, with us for quite a while. So their number one goal is to reduce the inflation. And so that's going to affect, you know, everything that, that, that has to do with money from a borrowing standpoint, right? Interest rates are going up. And the main takeaway from the whole Fed thing is it's going to cost you more to borrow in the coming months than it probably ever has. And so, you know, and the interest rates on homes are probably going to be the highest we've seen in a long time, possibly even since I've been alive. Um, so, so borrowing money is going to be interesting. Um, if you guys have short-term capital needs, uh, some interesting things that are happening, you know, there's actually returns on money market mutual funds and CDs are actually starting to give out a decent return. So people who have large piles of working capital, you can put that to work and try to fight inflation a little bit. That's kind of an opportunity you didn't really have through COVID. So that's a strategy point you can do. Um, but other than that, um, I think the main thing to know is that borrowing is going to be more expensive. So it's not a bad idea to have cash on hand. 
and so what you're looking at here, this is kind of the, the returns by sector and sector is just area of the economy. Um, energy, no surprise there because the price of oil was up to you know over $110 a barrel at one point. So energy as a sector has had great returns this year, but you've seen kind of, you know, what are traditionally referred to as defensive areas doing the best out of everything. Consumer staples, just think big companies like Procter and Gamble, um, you know, people that sell goods you're going to use whether there's a recession or not. Um, healthcare, of course, people are going to need to get healthcare no matter what. So not a surprise that those are the areas that are doing the best this year. And communication services, such companies like Google and Comcast and consumer discretionary companies like Amazon, those are suffering, you know, quite a bit just because, you know, that's where people are looking to draw down the quickest. So any questions on that? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, cool. Um, okay, so not much more to cover here. Um, it's interesting, you know, international stuff is probably not a, a big concern to everybody on this call, but basically, um, you know, our stock market has kind of performed on par with the larger capital markets in, you know, Europe and places like this. So my company is not really recommending you go overweight in international stocks. There's no real opportunity there other than emerging markets. I think companies like China, they've been really depressed throughout COVID. So there potentially is an opportunity to invest there and see some outsized returns, keeping in mind that they've had outsized losses for the past you know, couple of years. So depending on your risk tolerance, that might be an interesting area to look at. Um, but other than that, uh, the last thing I wanna show you from, from, a, from a macro market standpoint is historically speaking, here's a fun chart. Uh, purple is a bull market that everybody loves. Red's a bear market that everybody hates. And so the idea behind this is that, you know, bear markets are very common. You can see they happen all the time. You know, every two to five years, we're looking at a bear market. And then there's generally a pretty decent recovery that follows that. This tiny little spike down here, um, that's COVID. There was a nice recovery. Now we're in a bear market. And, you know, if history is any guide, we can be looking at, you know, a recovery that could be close to 167%, you know, within five years after the, this bull market. So that's the good news. I mean, we never, we never say history is always going to repeat itself, um, but it does really kind of rhyme as, as the man said. So um, questions on any of this? Cool. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to turn that one off. And then on the same note, um, here, here is some, point instances in time where there was a crisis and what happened in the market, right? So Cuban Missile Crisis, I don't know how many of us are old enough to remember that. I'm not, but I read about it. So the initial reaction to the Cuban Missile Crisis was a 1% positive change in the Dow. And then within 30, within almost a year, you know, a 30% increase. Um, the World Trade Center bombing, right? Small market downturn that day. Within 250 something days, the market's back up another 14%. Um, let's find a good one here that's recent. First confirmed coronavirus case, big reaction in the market down 36%, but a year later, it's up another 60. So the fun lesson here is that when there's a crisis event, there's usually a market downturn, right? The, the average is something along the lines of 6%. And then within a year, we're back up another 15%. So I'm only, I'm only sharing this again, you don't just say, oh, because it happened last time, that's what's gonna happen this time. But I'm trying to suggest that it's very common. It's happened a lot throughout history and it's painful and acute right now, but, but in general, there's going to be a recovery, right? Companies continue to innovate. They continue to come out with new products, just like you all do. And, you know, over time, they continue to add value to the economy and things will, will likely continue to grow. So questions on that before I, I hop off of this topic, but that's basically, um, you know, a few ways to look at where we're at right now and where we might be in a year. So is that 250 days, is that a common realistic timeline to start seeing some upward changes? Um, 
it's one of these things where it'd be, it'd be awesome if it was, but it's an average, right? It's an average. And so it's, it's mainly to, to highlight a trend. So I wouldn't start a 253 day clock or anything like this. Um, and, and it's when we deal with averages, you know, there, there's this tendency to say, well, this time is different. Well, this time is different. And I'm using numbers to tell you that it's not, it's not different. Like the numbers, you know, there have been times in history. I mean, we were at the brink of nuclear war, you know, at the Cuban Missile Crisis. Like, like those are crises. We have one now. Um, it's 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 always going to look and feel differently, but the mean suggests that it's going to move on from here. And and when you when you think about your portfolio, right? You're looking. If you have a good plan, your plan says, okay, in 30 years, if I save this amount of money, I'm going to have you know two million dollars to retire on or whatever your plan is, right? And, and you're gonna say, yeah, I wanna get 6% return, but I bet you could, you could look at your yearly returns every year and it'll never be 6% on the dot, not a single year, right? So you never know what it's gonna be. But the idea is that um, because of all that uncertainty, the more diverse you can be in your investments, the better chance you have on capturing the upside over time. Right. So we talked about crypto earlier. Some people might say, yeah, I want to have a little bit of crypto just in case. Right. But also have, you know, some quality asset classes, too, so that, you know, larger companies are going to recover more quickly sometimes than smaller companies. And so all that's just an argument for diversity and patience and a long term perspective. Right. So, you know, to the to the folks here on the call, um, I'd mentioned things about about short term investments. Right. And, and so my first kind of strategy point for you all is we're looking at, you know, possible recession. We might be in one now. Um, people are having trouble finding jobs. So right, right then and there, in the same way you'd want to have, as a personal investor, more cash available in case of an emergency, your business ought to have more cash available should something happen in your business, right? So whatever your working capital requirements are, think about, you know, pushing those up a little bit. You know, think about, hey, where, where is an opportunity to save a little bit more, have some more cash on hand in case it does get a little, a little tight, right? If you haven't made the decision, if you're in a, you know, if you're in the ability to hire, great. But if you don't need to hire, you know, maybe you shouldn't hire somebody or, or these type of things. So that would be, you know, a, a major, a major point. And, and the trade-off, of course, is holding on to cash is now very expensive because inflation's eating into it at you know between six and nine percent. So yet another thing you gotta you gotta dance around. Um, okay, let's let's go to the the audience here for some questions before I, I talk about anything else. I wanna I wanna see what's important to you guys and what, what questions you have, what you wanna what you want to hear from me. Can I please go ahead and, uh, yeah, I'm using and ask my question. Cool. Like, I'm going, okay. Yeah, so as a manufacturing company, uh, we've been facing a really hard time uh, dealing with that increasing uh, prices uh, for like logistics, transportation, and uh, materials. Yep. So can you uh, estimate something in this matter? It's hard. I mean, <laughs> do you have any projections? Um, no projections, uh, depending on what industry you're in, you know, I've, I've heard, I was telling Hannah before this call, I've heard some, uh, you know, a friend of mine owns a bakery and her raw material costs have gone up 45%, right? So there, there's no way that really that I have, and it's any better than what you guys have to estimate that. Um, but I think it, it is certainly safe to assume that costs will be high for a duration of time. Right, that's uncomfortable for everybody. And so, the you know, I thought about a lot of this this morning on my way to work. And there's a couple of ways that that this impacts a business, but there's always more than one way to handle it. And so, in the, let's go to the simple illustration of my friend who's who's in the bakery business. Right. So her raw material costs in some cases are 45 percent or higher. Right. So she cannot make a cupcake, and and you know, hope to sell it for the same price last year and make any money at all. Yet that is what they are still doing. And, and I asked why is she still doing that? You know, like, how do you, how are you going to make money? How are you going to survive as a business if you don't raise your prices? And she countered that by saying, well, if I raise my prices, I'm going to lose customers. Nobody's going to come into my shop and buy a $6 cupcake. Right. And, and so 
that's a very elementary way of looking at it, but you can't escape the reality that you can't make money selling that cupcake for $5 when, you know, when it should cost $6. And so we're all in this position where, you know, price is a problem, but I would counter that and say price is only a problem in the absence of value, right? And I think that's a Peter Drucker quote. I don't know who said it, but the idea is that if one day you, you had a $5 cupcake, it's now $6 cupcake. You have to find a way to communicate that value change to your customer base, right? So even in manufacturing, somebody has to bear that cost. And it's not always possible that it's the business. Sometimes the customer has to pay that cost. And the worst way of handling it is just to raise your costs and not tell anybody about it, right? But you have an opportunity to tell a story as a business owner or as a, as a marketer or as a, as a you know, salesperson. And you can discuss and, and socialize and tell a story about that cost, right? And my baker friend, you know, they make everything from scratch. They employ, you know, local people. They are women-owned business. They have been doing it for years. You know, they're, you can go meet them at their bakery and ask how they make it, right? You know, they're trying to source quality ingredients. And none of that story is being told, right? She's not telling anybody that. When you, when you just go and buy a cupcake, if you stand it up next to the King Supers cupcake, I mean, it certainly looks better, but the King Supers cupcake is, you know, $1.50. And, and there's no, other than what you would assume when you walk into a bakery, she's not communicating that value. So the lesson is, you know, how do you communicate to your customer why this thing has to cost $6, right? And there's so many ways to do that. But, but a story is typically the most compelling way, right? Like, hey, you know, here's why we do this. We, we believe that the best food is made by hand, you know, we want to have control over our process so that we know our ingredients are good, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of the day, we make this awesome cupcake. Sure, it's expensive, but here's why. Here's the story behind it, right? And, and the same, you know, Olga, I don't know how much opportunity you have to do that, but I think the res part of the response to these rising costs is just being able to talk to your customers about it and help them understand, you know, why some of that is going to be on them to bear. Is that, is that helpful at all? I mean, do you even have opportunities to do that? Well, pretty much. Uh, the only thing is that we are a startup company developing technology. And so we are going to the market in a few months. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not like uh, I'm dealing with the real customers right now. Uh, not yet. Yeah. Uh, but I need to project the price because I've been calculating the price of the technology like uh, six months, uh, well, almost eight months uh, ago. And now the price for materials, some of materials raised up to 100%, let's say. So I need to figure out what percentage of contingencies should I put into my calculation to uh, start marketing my technology yep. with a particular price. Yep. So one, one thing you can do, and, and we would do this um, with, with anybody who's writing up a business case, and, and you basically, you, you hedge and say, well, I don't know what's going to happen, but you make an expected case scenario, like, hey, if we expect the economy to kind of continue where it's at, that's going to be price X. If things go get worse, like this is the worst case scenario, it's probably never going to cost more than this, but this is how much it could be, right? And that maybe that's the 100% inflation case, right? And then you have a, a, a best case, which is, you know, maybe the Fed wrangles down inflation to 5% or something like that. We can, we can get a little break. So you, you give three projections, right? You give a range and you say, hey, here's what we think it's going to cost most likely. It might be, this is the worst case and this is the best case. And you let people, you know, you let those customers know we, we don't have a handle on it, frankly. And the main variable is supply chain, but here's, here's what it might be. And here's what we hope it is. You know, let, let people kind of understand that, it, that the range is possible, you know? That's an interesting approach. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. And and it kind of like I, I I know there's always sensitivity around price. Like nobody wants to pay more than than something is worth and, and all of this. Um, but I, I've always been a proponent of over communicating to people, right? Like it, it's always better, I think, to be proactive and communicate and say, hey, this could be a situation, than tend to react and say, well, yeah, we said it was going to be $50 a unit a month ago, but now it's 200, right? That's going to, that's going to really upset a customer. But if you say, look, we hope it's 50 cents a unit, it's possible. And here's what we would take to get there. But here's another option. You know, if, if those containers are still sitting off the coast of LA, like this is where we're going to be, you know? So yeah, I think the more 
the more you can involve your potential customers in, in, in that communication cycle, the better off you'll be and the more leverage you'll have, I think. Yeah, good question. Um, hopefully that was helpful. What else you guys got? Who's got something else? Nothing? Okay. I had a, I had another um, thing I wanted, to, I wanted to throw at you guys. <laughs> Um, cause it, it, it made me think of, um, boom, the boom and bust cycle, just like the market has a boom and bust cycle. Businesses also go through these things, right? They go through some of them, a high growth cycle. Um, and you, you know, although you're in technology, so you may see that, you know, the, the early adoption cycle and, and, you know, a, a really very quick accelerated growth curve, you know, followed by something else. Right. And one of the things that can happen during a growth phase, which some companies experience through COVID is lack of focus, right? You start with something and then money comes in the door, all of a sudden your business grows and one day you were making lemonade and now you're making, you know, five or six different products, you know, selling all these other things and you've lost focus on what originally put you in business. So I came up with the lemonade idea just to quickly illustrate what can happen and now that we know, hey, maybe there is a recession or maybe there's gonna be a contraction in the economy, how do we get back to focus? And so I thought about a, you know, a young kid named, we'll just call him Johnny, got a lemonade stand. And you know, he starts his lemonade stand out there in the open space, it's really hot. So he makes fresh squeezed lemonade to the people who are biking, jogging and walking their dogs. Very quickly realizes people want this, sells his lemonade for $2 a cup hires on his sister to help him out and squeeze more lemons so he can make more lemonade. And now he's got employees to deal with. Uh, so there's a little bit less money coming in, but he's making more lemonade, selling more lemons, or sorry, selling more lemonade. And then, you know, one day he and his sister are talking and she comments that, hey, we could make more money if we sold people brownies because they seem really hungry when they have this lemonade. And John's like, that seems like a great idea. So now they're selling brownies and lemonade and then all of a sudden the sister says, well, you know, we can make more money if we had gluten-free brownies because a lot of people can't have these other ones because they're, they're, you know, gluten intolerant. So now they've got lemonade, gluten-free brownies and regular brownies. So their empire is expanding, you know, and, and as the summer goes on, the, the, the folks who really like it say, hey, I'm inspired. I want to inspire my child. Do you guys have any t-shirts? I could give my kid a t-shirt so he can see how cool your lemonade stand is. Johnny and Susie are like, great idea. Let's get some t-shirts. So they order a bunch of t-shirts and then they're selling, you know, one or two t-shirts a day, inspiring people. And at the end of the summer, their empire is, they're selling lemonade. They're selling two kinds of brownies. They've got an inventory of t-shirts. And all of a sudden, Johnny's and Susie's mom's like, okay, kids, time to go back to school. And then lemonade stand dries up. There's nothing there, right? And so now they got a garage full of, you know, flour and gluten-free flour, you know, a hundred t-shirts that they didn't sell and all this other infrastructure to support a business that's unsustainable after the, you know, after the initial thing, right? And so the simple lesson here is, you know, they, they very quickly lost focus on what they were trying to do and instead just looking for where else they could make some money. And I think, you know, as, as, a, as an investor, you know, we just talked about the market update we got to stay focused on what our plan is and why we're investing, right? And, and, and stay true to those elements and not chase after the shiny objects. The same is true in your business when you're trying to figure out, hey, how do I get ready for a recession? How do I get ready for something? You better know what your business is, right? You better know what are, what are the products that make me money? You know, what is the best marketing channel I can deploy? Is it email? Is it a sign outside my door, whatever it is, and, and figure out what is wasting money and what is actually contributing to growing your business. And there is where I think you apply the focus, right? So what products are, are my most popular, my flagship products that make me money? You know, how do I protect that? Um, you know, and how do I protect the operations that are core to my business? Because it's super easy to get distracted. Believe me, I've, I've, I've been there. You know, I know how hard that is. But I, you know, you trim that stuff away and you you stay focused on the lemonade that, that you are making out of the lemons of life, right? You know, you 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 take care of the customers who take care of you and you stay focused on something like that. 
And that is going to be your guiding star, I think, through through tough economic times. I mean, you know, there, there are so many ways to look at that. And I hope that's a little bit valuable in some fashion. I know it's kind of a, a overly simplistic way of viewing things, but we can all probably find an example in our lives where we've overcomplicated something or we've we've lost a little bit of focus on on what was successful. Um, and, and it all comes back to the value, right? Price is only a problem in the absence of value, but as long as you're adding value somewhere, you know, there will be there will be a business there. So anyway. Adrian, that is one of the biggest pitfalls I think we see clients fall into when they're in the startup phase, is they have so many great ideas and it's kind of addicting almost to want to just like do it all. Yep. Um, but then that gets really convoluted and complicated to communicate to their customers of what is the value? What are you actually selling? Who are you? What are you actually doing? It's not a straightforward, streamlined communication process um, when too many ideas and products or services are getting all thrown in at the same time. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up because that is something that we see a lot with our clients. Yeah. And it's hard because because the, the idea part's the fun part, right? You know, yeah. everybody wants to to do something fun and, and different. Um, you know, I, I was I'm driving around and I see, you know, like a coffee shop that's a wine bar and and has beer tastings on Fridays, right? That's a that's a business with no identity, you know. Like I don't I don't understand that. And and I think it's confusing for customers too. Um, you know, and, and there's a thousand examples like that, but you know, at some point, sure, you're going to want to add different things, but it all comes down to what the value is to your particular customer. And, and Olga, since you're still with us, I actually worked with a, um, a consultant who was with a solar, like a solar install company in California, and they, they were missing a huge piece of revenue with every job they did because they had no way, they had no financing, right? So the the, the customer would say, I want to have a solar roof put in and they would have to have the finance company come in and, and be a completely different entity and, and handle the financing part of it. So she was trying to work with this company to bring the financing part in house, right? So now you, the customer would go to, I'm just going to make up a name like solar edge. They would go to solar edge and they would buy the product, they could finance the product there and get it installed there. So to me, like that made sense, right? That's a nice value to the, to the consumer who just wants to get the roof put on, right? And they don't wanna to have to deal with two different companies when they can go all, all in with, with one sort of company. So there are ways, you know, that, that's, a, that's a nice way of expanding your offering and saying, you know, if the value is, you know, there to the consumer of, of simplicity and just getting the roof done quicker and easier sure you know that's a nice a nice way of doing it but that's not always the case like you don't do that for um the bakery you don't finance the cupcake <laughs> you know like, you're not gonna provide in-house financing for a six dollar cupcake so it's not always appropriate anyway recent example from recent life yeah so adrian i have another question um yeah. obviously we're seeing that um raw materials are costing a lot more and so could lead to needing to raise prices down the road as prices stabilize do you then decrease your price or is that weird uh, that's the the $64,000 question <laughs> so you know that's a business choice you have to make and and i think um we have we have this other maxim from business school i remember that it's always easier to retain a customer than it is to get a new one. And so you guys are all familiar with customer loyalty programs. And these types of programs are designed with the idea that it's cheaper to maintain a customer than it is to get a new one, right? And so on some level, as a business owner, it's important to be loyal to your customer base also and give them, you know, something in return for, for being loyal to you. So Personally, I'm an advocate of, of fair pricing. You know, I think it is important that if, if you do see material costs go down, then, you know, you, you communicate that to the customers and you make a point of saying, ah, you know, we're back to $5.50 for the cupcake. Thank you for your loyalty. Where that, that's my opinion. But then you look at companies like, uh, you know, General Mills and, and P&G, and they've learned over time that um, 
consumers are, don't pay attention. And so what they'll do is the price of a box of cereal remains at $3, the amount you get just changes. <laughs> so, so when's the last time you got a carton of orange juice that had 64 ounces in it, like you did when you were a kid? It's been a few years, right? So they call that one shrinkflation, but that's everywhere. You know, everybody's doing that. You know, a bag of coffee was 16 ounces um, up until five years ago, and they, they shrunk it down to 12. I think we have Starbucks to blame for that. But I've seen eight ounce bags of coffee now that, that look pretty close, um, you know, four, four pound bags of sugar. Uh, the look and feel is very similar, you know, but, but nobody from those companies is communicating that to the customer. It's on us to, to keep abreast of that. So for small businesses, though, I think, you know, it's a different deal. There's a great book out there called Storynomics. If you've ever been to any of my other webinars, you've probably heard me mention it. But Storynomics is about using the power of story to, to introduce, you know, customers to, you know, products and things like that. And, and I think telling the story is always more compelling than, than just doing something. So, you know, my recommendation to the folks at the bakery was tell the story, you know, involve your customers in the story of that $6 cupcake. And, and you know, when, it, when it's a good story, you tell them a good story. When it's a bad story, you know, you tell them a bad story. So it's a good one. You can get it at the Front Range Library. It's where I got my copy, oh. the business section. So good, good question though. What else you got? Anything else? I guess I'm curious what, I mean, you've had some good encouragements for small businesses that, you know, this most likely isn't how it's going to be forever. Like there is going to be an end in sight at some point and things will stabilize historically. Mm -hmm. um, do you have other encouragements that you would want small businesses to, to take away from this? Um, several <laughs> encouragements. Uh, yeah, encouragements, but also... Um, in the same way that I suggested to Olga that you have a best case, worst case and expected case scenario, I think every business owner ought to have that for themselves and they ought to have, they ought to have what, what I would call no-go criteria. If it's just a no-go, it's a no-go and, and you have to learn to cut, to cut your losses and say it's not going to happen, right? And this is, this is, I'll do the bad one first before I get to encouragements. <laughs> um, and, and I'm saying this because, you know, nobody wants to be bankrupted by a business. Nobody wants it to fail, but it does happen. It happens a lot. And I think that it's important to know what success looks like. And it's important to know when it's time to go and, and not hang on too long or not, you know, not try to pull blood out of a stone that's never coming. You know, I, I don't, there's no nice way to sugarcoat it, but I think that that's important, right? Like there, there are days at work when I look at a plan and this person is not going to get there, right? And, and part of my job is to be honest with them and say, this is not ever going to happen, you know, unless something drastic changes. So we need to make changes. And that's got to be part of everybody's business plan too. You know, if at some point, you know, money aside, it's stressful on you, it's stressful on your family, it's stressful on your life. And if, if you're constantly chasing something that's not working, you know, waiting, waiting for something to change, chances are that that's you, you know, <laughs> that you need to change. So, so there, there should be, I think everybody needs to prepare themselves for that, that, Hey, maybe there is a point at which, you know, it's unrecoverable and that's okay. You know, that, that is not a reflection of you doing anything wrong or, or, you know, being good or bad at something, but it's just kind of, a possibility in life that you should be prepared for, right? We aren't, we aren't all born into, you know, being Elon Musk or something like this. So, but on the, but on the encouragement side, um, a, a thing that is just so powerful that people often don't do is ask for help, right? That's why the SBDC is there. There's a bunch of people who just want to help. And, and a lot of people are just good natured, you know, and you could take some of their good natured suggestions with a grain of salt, but the more people you ask, you're going to find people who actually will help you and, and who can help you or put you in touch with somebody that will. So, you know, when, when, the, going, when the going gets tough, the tough ask for help. That's what they do. And, and they get it. So never, you know, never let pride or anything like that stand in the way of a good conversation with somebody who can help you. Um, 
it's, it's, you know, get a mentor, get, get somebody who's been down that road, get somebody who um, is, you know, way more successful than you and just ask, right? Find out what they're doing. Um, I, I can't stress that enough. There's so many ways to do that. Uh, and there's so many people who are probably right now studying whatever problem you're having, who just want to talk to you about it. So I'd say from an encouragement standpoint, um, you know, push, push yourself into doing something you haven't done before, right? And ask, reach out, see what happens. Something fun will happen. As my sister would say, a thing will happen. <laughs> no, it is, but something will. That's great. Thank you. Sure. And that is really encouraging. And yes, we would love um, to get you connected with one of our consultants at the SPDC. If you're looking for some of that guidance, it's free and remote. It's so easy to take advantage of. Um, so we just really encourage that. Uh, the link to schedule an appointment is there in the chat. And I didn't mention this at the beginning, um, but this session is sponsored by the Brighton Economic Development Corporation. So for any of you who are located in Brighton, they have fantastic resources that you can check out um, on their website, which is also there in the chat. And even if you're not in Brighton, your city's economic development corporation um, has resources for you as well. So there's lots of resources out there. Like Adrian said, a lot of people that want to help you as a small business owner. So hopefully that is encouraging. And Adrian and I um, also want to make sure we cover a question that comes up a lot and part right. of what led to this type of session is what is the best way for small business owners to stay updated on what's going on in the market and how do you know how can you find a trustworthy source yeah um i mean again i would say for, for updates you can just ignore pretty much anything that comes onto your phone <laughs> you know that, that would be my starting point um but but up, updates, I'm going to answer this question unconventionally here, Hannah. Updates are not terribly useful. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you're concerned about this kind of thing, talk with a professional, somebody like me or somebody who, who does what I do. And very quickly, you will learn that because we're dealing with things on a macro scale and long term, what happened yesterday doesn't matter, right? It isn't going to matter to a good plan. And so you can almost ignore it and put it out of your mind, right? Like there's no, it's interesting, it's compelling. There's a lot of fear words that they use in the media to, to kind of get people excited about it. But the reality is, you know, there, there are so many things to track and so much knowledge to have. No one person could ever have it all. And no one, you know, 30 second article is going to give you insight that is really valuable. So I would say, you know, if it's a, if it's concern for you, you want updates, engage with the professional and get that from a source that that you can evaluate yourself. Right, Market Watch is trying to sell you ads, but a professional you know can provide better advice that's suited to you and tailored to your specific situation. So that's what I would do. Um, you know, that's what I do for for my life. But I'm not the only one. There's a ton of us out there all doing good work. So reach out to your network, reach out to me, but but find a professional, you know, you, you take your car to get its oil changed, you go to a doctor when you're sick, like, you know, there are people who do this thing for, for a living. And, and I would recommend you go and at least chat with one of them. Um, if, if you have concerns, if you feel like updates are valuable, get some valuable updates. That's what I would do. Words of wisdom. Thank mm -hmm. you. Full of them. <laughs> Great. Well, any other questions um, from any of you for Adrian today? All right. All right. Well, Simple. yeah, Adrian, we really appreciate all your uh, encouragements and knowledge and expertise and everything that you've given to us today. So thank you so much for um, preparing this conversation for us. And thank you, um, all of our attendees for participating and joining us today. Um, I'll send out the recording later this afternoon. So you can kind of take a look at those, um, especially those screenshots that Adrian was sharing in the beginning might be interesting to you. Um, oh, yeah, I can send that out. I didn't even think about oh, it. I, okay. can, I can give you that report. Um, Awesome. Let me, does this thing let me share stuff uh, like a document? Uh-huh. Yeah. You can put that in the chat, a little paper sign. 
Yeah, here, before you all run away, let me see if I can figure out how to do that. I didn't even think about that, but sure. Yeah, thank you. I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, and that that's one that we do. My company does that every quarter. And so I found that, you know, kind of quarterly is about the 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 smallest time horizon I'd even worry about it, something like that. So that's why I'm using this and not something that happened, you know, from a weekly standpoint or something like that. It's just not, not enough happens. Okay, here we go. And Adrian, you work, um, you do financial planning for small businesses specifically in the Westminster area. Is that true? I, I will, I do. I primarily um, work with families, but I do also work with a number of small businesses. Oh, okay. And what I generally see, you know, it's, it's along the lines of things where we're, we're trying to have smart cash management um, solutions, right? And it was pretty dark times for a couple of years in COVID. There just weren't real, real good options for short-term cash. But, for, you know, for business, some businesses have big payrolls, so they have, you know, large working capital requirements. And, you know, there's, there's ways to get a little better return on that now. Um, and things like small, you know, simple IRAs or SEP IRAs, things like that for business owners. There's a ton of stuff as a business owner that you can take advantage of that, you know, folks who just work for a large company don't necessarily have access to. So that, those are the main things that I do. Um, I don't do a lot with 401ks um, specific to small companies. Other advisors have, have a little bit larger um, roles in that, but most of my stuff is contained to what I, what I would consider, you know, like 30 people or smaller businesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Great. Good to know. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you all again for joining us and we wish you a great rest of your day. Awesome. All right. Be well, everyone.